feel. I, uh... All right, good morning, everyone. We are going to continue what we started in December uh, by starting with a kid's song. So if I'd invite everyone under the age of 12 to come on up here with me, and we're going to start. And uh, once you see what it is, you might want to join in. But uh, actually, I encourage you to join in. No, right here, just stand right here. Take a shaker. And stand right there, because you're going to need to be out in the middle of this. Choose a good color. Anyone else who wants to just, you know, sing like a kid, you can come down here, too. No problem. <laughs> All right, so everybody stand out here. Stand out here. All right, so first let's practice shaking, okay? So... Here's the rhythm. Okay, that's good. Now, this song says it's a great day to praise the Lord, and we're going to do several different things. First, we're going to do is walking. So can you shake it while walking? Okay, that one's easy, right? Can you do it running? That's good. Now, hopping is one foot, jumping is two feet, right? All right, you guys, you, you're going to be fine. So this is a really easy song. It goes like this. It's, like this. it's a great day to praise the Lord. It's a great day to praise the Lord. It's a great day to praise the Lord, walking in the light of God. So walk, 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 walk in the light. Walk, 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 walk in the light. Walk, 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 walk in the light, walking in the light of God. It's a great day to praise the Lord. It's a great day to praise the Lord. It's a great day to praise the Lord, running in the light of God. So run, 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 run in the light. Run, 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 run in the light. Run, 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 run in the light, running in the light of God. It's a great day to praise the Lord. It's a great day to praise the Lord. It's a great day to praise the Lord, hopping in the light of God. So hop, 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 hop in the light. Hop, 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 hop in the light. Hop, 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 hop in the light. Hopping in the light of God. It's a great day to praise the Lord. It's a great day to praise the Lord. It's a great day to praise the Lord, jumping in the light of God. So jump, 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 jump in the light. Jump, 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 jump in the light. It's a great day to praise the Lord. It's a great day to praise the Lord. It's a great day to praise the Lord. Spinning in the light of God. So spin, 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 spin in the light. Spin, 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 spin in the light. Spin, 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 spinning in the light. Last time. It's a great day to praise the Lord. It's a great day to praise the Lord. It's a great day to praise the Lord. Walking in the light of God. Roran's already got the old man hop. No air, just, that was great. All right, thank you guys. All right, would you stand for our scripture reading, please? From Psalm 63. O oh, true God, you are my God, the one whom I trust. In this dry and weary land with no water in sight, my soul is dry and longs for you. My body aches for you, for your presence. I have seen you in your sanctuary and have been awed by your power and glory.
So we're going to move from the children's song to the opening hymn. I'll have my quartet come on up and we'll sing this together. This is hymn number eight. You'll need to open up your hymn book and uh, turn to number eight, Come Thou Almighty King. prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
never fails me all my days I've been held in your hand the moment I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God you have with us today and every day, Lord, help us to know um, who you are. Reveal yourself to us, Lord. Help us to know that you are true, you are good, and your promises will ring true for us, Lord. We just praise you for this morning. Lord, thank you for keeping us all safe on our travels here, keeping us safe home. In Jesus' name, amen. You be seated.
Okay, this morning we re-engage with our, um, our study of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we began studying this, this narrative of Jesus' life at the beginning of August, and we made it all the way through chapter 5 by the end of November. And uh, so we're going to read, we have 10 chapters left, and we're going to start now, beginning of January, and hopefully if I can do this right, we'll end up in the final couple chapters of Mark as we hit Easter. That's my goal at least, and we'll see if we can get there. Um, Today what I'd like to do is provide us with a recap of what we've studied, uh, reminding us of the three lenses that we've been using and why uh, any of this matters for those of us living in 2022 in Walton, New York, in the United States of America. Because honestly, it could be argued that you know, these stories from 2,000 years ago uh, that occurred some 5,800 miles away from us, which is what Google Maps told me, (laughs) that happened in a very different culture than ours, in a different language completely from ours, could be argued that it has no relevance uh, to us at all. I mean, you know, we don't study the documents of ancient China and look for truth in there, right? Not often. Uh, We don't study the Upanishads of Indian religion, written 3,000 years ago. Um, We don't study the stories of the Maasai tribe in Kenya. So why do we study the stories of this little sliver of a nation on the edge of the Mediterranean, stories that happened 2,000 years ago? Why do we study that so much. I mean, why do we find ourselves reflecting on the stories of Jesus? Timing, you know, to, to trying to figure out what he said and why he said it and what he meant and what it means to us today. I mean, why do you put up with me talking about it every week? You know, why do we gather to sing songs like we just did about Jesus, to read scripture that points to him, to, to pray to, you know, with each other to him? Why do we try to honor his name above every name that we know, you know, in our friends and family and our entire relational network. Why do we do this? I mean, it's a good question to to answer every so often, and here at the beginning of the new year, I think it's really appropriate. Why do we uh, do what we do? Um, Why do we all risk our lives uh, to to drive here this morning? Um, I remember several years ago when our family lived in Huntington Beach, uh, I I had been playing basketball at a local park uh, in town, you know, a couple times a week after, after work, you know, and I had made a number of acquaintances with all the guys that had come there, you know, regularly, and I was doing what I've asked all of you to do, which was I was showing as much as I could in the midst of a basketball game, showing love and kindness to them, making friends with them, so I could give them an invite at some point, right? And I, you know, I, I worked as hard as I could to become known as a, you know, a good guy, good team player. Anyway, one day in December, a couple years in, uh, before we started playing, um, I was standing there with a couple of the guys that I had actually made friends with by that time, and I gathered up my courage, and I asked them, you know, if they would like to come to our Christmas Eve service. And I'll never forget the look of, of absolute puzzlement on both of their faces as they pondered my invitation. And the oldest guy, his name was Al, he was, I don't know, maybe seven or ten years older than me. He just said, why? You know, I invited him. He said, why? I mean, he wasn't unkind. He just, he was puzzled as to why he ought to consider that as a possibility for his Christmas Eve evening. Why would he spend his time, you know, that way? I don't think he was against the idea per se. It just, he was really puzzled as to why anyone would spend time on a Christmas Eve going to church. He saw no point at it. And I remember thinking, you know, that was not the response I was expecting. Uh, And I most definitely was not prepared to give him an answer. Uh, Why should he go? I mean, yeah, why should he attend a Christmas Eve service at church if he had no knowledge of Jesus or no desire to study about him? He certainly had no longing to sing songs about Jesus. So from Al's perspective... It didn't make sense at all. 
it made sense to me, and I'm sure it makes sense to all of you. I mean, we have reasons for attending, perhaps, but for someone who has never attended church before or ever considered the claims of Jesus, why is a perfect question. Why? Anyway, neither of my friends accepted my invite that year, um, and I didn't have a good comeback for him or answer to his question. I mean, if I had been, you know, I figured if I had been inviting him to a bar, at least he would have had a drink. If I had been inviting him to a party, at least he could have enjoyed the food or whatever. If I had invited him to a sporting event, at least he could have enjoyed the game. But church? Why? You know, what was there that was attractive to him in the least in my invitation? His simple question, it stunned me, and I still remember it now, 15 years later. I, and I decided I had to really think through that response, my response. I really needed to think through that because that was an important question that he asked. What could I say that would be understandable and even convincing. Would you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1? This is page 1131 in your pew Bible. And once you get there, you can stand and we'll read a passage together. Page 1131. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And once you get there, you can stand. And we're going to read verses 18 to 30. You see, 18 to 31. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 18, let's read this together. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. You can be seated. So in this teaching, the Apostle Paul begins to teach us that what we're, what we're up against as followers of Jesus, who want to invite others to at least consider being one as well. To most folks, the idea that Jesus matters or that his words are true and life-changing or the idea that you know, he has called a group of people to gather in his name and, and called the church and their task is to proclaim uh, the, to the world that there's this light shining in the darkness and his name is Jesus, most people feel like that's absolute foolishness. Uh, why would anyone believe that? It certainly didn't make sense to my friend Al at that moment. He, it wasn't that he was opposed to it. It's just, you know, he couldn't understand why anyone would want to spend their time that way. You know, to him it was, well, what does verse 18 say? The word of the cross is what, according to verse 18? Yeah, folly, foolishness. Folly in Greek is moria, which means absurdity. It's an absurdity. Right? And that's the right word. My invite to my friend at that moment, it came across like, what on earth? Why would I do that? It was absurd to him. 
I still wanted to invite them, though, you know, so I, I feel like I really had to think through what I was going to say the next time I gave him an invite, and, you know, if he happened to ask why, I'd actually have something to say. And this, this passage here in 1 Corinthians 1 actually really helped me. So let me just share with you a few of the lessons that I pulled out of it, and maybe it'll help you as well. First lesson is, it tells us that it is possible that the message of Jesus can be, it can be absurd to one person while literally being salvation to another, right? It's possible. And the vast difference between those two responses, it really shouldn't be resp- uh, surprising to us. Because, I mean, I, mean I, had never, I had never met someone who was, you know, who was so unchurched that going to Christmas Eve service was an absurdity to consider until I had this experience with Albert. But maybe you've had that experience with someone who's close to you, family or friends. Maybe they think that what you do on a Sunday morning is a complete waste of time. It comes across as, what, what on earth? Why, why would I do that? Right? Only morons spend time like that, waste time. You know? What I learned in this scripture passage is that response shouldn't surprise me. In fact, God crafted it that way. He, God arranged the gospel of Jesus in such a way that it literally doesn't make sense to some people. Why did God do that? Well, that's the second lesson that I pulled out of this this passage. The story of Jesus, you know, coming to earth, being born of a virgin, uh, growing into a teaching rabbi who offended everybody and eventually got himself killed, that story is designed by God to make sense to some, but to not make sense to others, according to the wisdom of the world. You can see this in verse 19. If you take a look at verse 19, God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. In other words, you know, th- through Jesus, God is not just sending a Savior to the world to set prisoners free, free. He is also demonstrating that the wisdom of the world is not actually very wise at all. In fact, it is inadequate to make the world a better place, no matter what humans think. And the discernment that humans arrogantly feel like they have, the ability to, you know, to understand why things are the way they are, that's not a very discerning at all. You know, through Jesus, God reveals how and why human intellect and skill are not enough to create a beautiful world where all things flourish. Through Jesus, God makes the case that humans are the problem, not the solution. So God is not just trying to save people from their sins through Jesus. He is also demonstrating why they need to be saved. And that leads me to the, the final lesson, really, from this passage. How, how then do I communicate to people who think that you know, what is valuable to me is an absurd waste of time to them? Well, verse 20 says, first of all, you don't engage with them through debate. You know, Paul says, where's the debater of this age? You know, the, the message of Jesus will be foolishness to them. You, you're not gonna, you shouldn't waste your time debating about it Because God has crafted the message of Jesus in such a way that its power and its truth will not be convincing through logic or rhetorical debate. It's just not going to be that way. You can't argue someone into the kingdom. Paul tried it over and over and over as you read through his letters, and he just got frustrated more over and over again, right? Debate isn't going to work. It's actually a dead end trying to convince someone, which of course is what everyone does on on social media nowadays, trying to debate about the kingdom of God, and, and it just simply doesn't ever move forward that way. Likewise, in verse 22, you see that Paul says that some people want signs, right? Which, you know, in this context, it means they want some kind of miracle to prove the validity of Jesus' message. And, and who doesn't? I mean, I would love to have a few miracles that I could point to as irrefutable proof, but I just don't. All I have is a story where miracles happen in it, but I can't actually prove it through miracles. And others, Paul says, want wisdom which in this context means human explanation as to why Jesus makes sense to their lives. They want an explanation, but but neither signs nor explanation are very useful because the true nature of the story of Jesus revolves around the absurdity that the creator of all things allowed himself to be crucified on a cross, humiliated by those that he created. It is an absurd idea. So whether you engage in debate 
or you produce signs or wise explanation, none of those can get a person past the absurd part of the story. It might get them a certain amount of way, but eventually they have to grapple with that part of the story. And it doesn't make sense according to human wisdom. I mean, how does one person's death bring about life for others? How does that work? How can any one person's humiliation bring hope and joy and love to others? You know, why would God bring about the salvation of humanity through a Roman instrument of torture? Why would he do that? You see, you and I need to understand that, that we can spend all kinds of time explaining the story of Jesus to people, especially the easy parts, being born as a baby like we just celebrated, so meek and mild that he doesn't even cry, unlike every other baby in the world, right? No. That's what our carols tell us. Um, and through his early years, you know, where he's, he's working hard to become a, a voice that people listen to, and he's treating people really well, and he, you know, raises up those who have been crushed, and he is humble and meek, and, and his teaching has real power. All of that is easy to share about Jesus, but eventually you have to get to the absurd parts, that he actually let himself, the creator of all things, let himself be killed and humiliated like a common criminal. As Paul says, Christ crucified is a stumbling block. It's a stumbling block, that part of it. It's not a, you know, a helpful stone that we step on to cross a rough patch. It's actually a stone purposely placed in the path to trip people up. So we should not be surprised when we encounter people who do not understand why we do what we do, or even if they even get angry at it. Because, you know, when I stumble over a stone, and this happens every so often, I get angry at myself. Well, first of all, I direct my anger at the stone, which is, of course, ridiculous. But I do get angry. That is what has happened. You know, when, when you stumble, you get angry. I hate being clumsy. It makes me feel less than adequate. Well, the story of Jesus, it was designed by God to cause some people to stumble so they would realize their inadequacy, especially those who rely on the wisdom of the world to explain life. You know, they stumble because Jesus' way seems like a foolish way to live. Right? It seems foolish to turn the other cheek. I just tell you, as I was thinking through why Al would think it was so absurd, I realized on the basketball court, you couldn't turn the other cheek if you wanted to win. You can't. You actually have to go harder when they go at you, right? In any sport, you actually, it's the antithesis of what Jesus actually says to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile, to love your enemies. It is absurd from human wisdom point of view. It's an absurd. It's exercising self-control over my desires, you know, saying no when I could easily just say yes. You know, what kind of moron does that? People stumble over it. Likewise, Jesus' path to power is not the normal path. He says that in order to go up, you've got to right, go down. If you want to be the greatest, you've got to be the, the least. You know, if you want to have true power, you've got to become the servant of all. I mean, what kind of absurdity is that? The wisdom of the world tells us the exact opposite. In fact, it demonstrates it daily. Right? So that kind of idea irritates people and it offends people. It makes people angry. It produces guilt and shame and makes people feel inadequate. They stumble over it. And all of that is why I have focused our study on the Gospel of Mark, looking at the different ways that God uses Jesus, because Jesus is not just the culmination of the redemption story, right, from Adam to Abraham to Moses to David. He's not just that. He also is a sign that human wisdom is temporary. And though occasionally helpful and useful, more often, it's the problem. It's not the solution. And same with, you know, uh, human power, right? Human power is only temporary, no matter what you think, right? And though occasionally it's useful, it's beneficial, it's not the answer for the world's brokenness, right? So Jesus' story wasn't just about rescuing people. 
It was also about God demonstrating to people why there's a problem in the first place. And that's really important. Jesus doesn't just provide a way to relieve guilt and shame and secure us a promise of a bright future. He also is a lesson that God was teaching humanity. And here's the lesson. There is a way that seems right to people, but in the end, it leads to death. And many walk that road because it's wide and easy and popular and it appears safe because there's safety in numbers. They find it by following their own wisdom, following their own understanding of power, believing that it can you know, be used for good. The way to life, however, <laughs> in contrast, is really narrow. And few find it because turning away from the wisdom of the world to the wisdom of God, initially it feels foolish, like an absurd way to live. And embracing the power of God, which Jesus re reveals as being a release of control, that sounds crazy to those of us who are control people. But that's why the road is so narrow. Few find it. Not everyone convinced themselves that they can leave the crowd behind and follow in the footsteps of a Jewish rabbi from 2,000 years ago who lived in this country 5,800 miles away from us. But for those who do believe in his name, he gives them the privilege or the right to be part of God's family, to be loved and cared for and provided for by the Creator himself from this day into eternity. And that's why we come on a Sunday, you know, in the new year. We gather as a congregation each week because we are striving to walk the narrow path. We are working hard to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, the crucified one, even if we you know, never feel like we can adequately explain to someone why we do what we do. Uh, even if our invites make us look foolish, which I certainly felt foolish at that moment when I asked Al. Even if they never say yes, uh, we have chosen this path and we stay on it because in some way it has allowed each of us to taste a little bit of God, what God's, being part of God's family feels like. And we want that more than anything else. You know, out of sheer love, we want those around us to join us on this path. And that's why we keep inviting them even if they've turned us down. And, you know, my friend Al never became a follower of Jesus as far as I know. Um, but a few years after my initial invite failed, he accepted several invites, actually, and came to Christmas and Easter. You know, I didn't give up. And he never asked why again, even though I was ready. <laughs> but I'm glad about that, because what actually happened was that over the next few years, we became such good friends that when I asked him if he would like to attend something that mattered to me, he said, sure because it mattered to me. But when he did that, of course, then he was able to actually hear this message of Jesus. And I think it still was foolishness to him, but it's okay. Right? I'm just doing what I'm supposed to be doing. The bread and the cup that are before us today, uh, they remind us of the foolishness of God. How the foolishness of God led his son Jesus to death, how the power of God was actually laid down so that Jesus could be humiliated by those he loved. The bread and the cup remind us of that strategy, and they point the way down this narrow road that we're walking together. Salvation and transformation are ahead of us. They are. So let us not grow weary in our well-doing, but persevere and keep on marching, right? continuing forward one step at a time. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to invite you to come down and go either, either direction, and then back out, back to your seat, and then we'll take it together. Those of you who are gluten-free people, come this way, because there's an option over here. Um, once you are seated, we'll take it together. And uh, the worship team will be doing a song while we do this. So let's pray. Jesus, we are, um, we are continually amazed 
that your story has so much power for us in our lives. We're grateful for all the small ways that you are changing us into people that are beautiful inside and out. The generosity that you produce within us, the willingness to help others, the willingness to sacrifice for others, the courage to love those that are unlovely, to treat our enemies well. Um, grateful for all these ways that you are transforming us. And we are aware that it, the story itself is a little bit absurd, but we also agree together this morning that you designed it that way, and so that's the best we got. By your wisdom, God, you have designed it so. So may we embrace the absurdity, may we embrace the foolishness that in truth is your wisdom, and uh, may it be meaningful this morning. pray this in your name. of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold
bread and he broke it and he said this is my body broken for you every time you eat of it remember me then he took the cup and he said this is my blood spilled for you every time you drink it
we have more opportunities this coming week for us to gather in the name of Jesus and to figure out how best to send out invites and serve him. Um, tonight we have a Night to Shine meeting at 5 p.m. if you're part of that leadership. This is coming up in one month, and we're going to need uh, most all of you to participate in some way, volunteering. Um, the last week is the week when we begin to uh, put out all kinds of stuff, so we'll let you more, know more about that in the coming weeks. Um, other things, there's volleyball this uh, th Tuesday night. Uh, Wednesday, there's no choir rehearsal, um, uh, but we do have worship band at 6 this coming Wednesday. Uh, basketball also Wednesday night. Friday, we have K4J and youth group here. Um, and then this Thursday night is a deacons meeting for those of you who are, who are part of that. And then next week, next Sunday, after the service, we're going to have our annual uh, church potluck and meeting, and uh, we'll have a chance to share about what's happened this past year that was good. Uh, most of it was good. Uh, we had just a few things that were not, but most of it was good, and God has done some great work. So that's right after the service next week. Um, so please bring, what are they supposed to bring? A hot dish? A dessert? Yes, okay, great. Food and dessert. Levi's tables tomorrow night. Hmm, okay, got that. Picnic? What does that mean? Hot dogs. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, also, for deacons, if you have not yet submitted your a report for the annual report, we need that soon, as in, you know, tomorrow or Tuesday. All right, so Joan can uh, put it all together for everyone else. All right, printing it off on the 14th. When is that? Friday? Okay. All right. Uh, any other announcements that I missed? Well, as this song that we just sang uh, says, uh, would you, as you, as you go, would you go forward in, in the peace of Jesus, knowing that uh, the message actually that you embody is actually foolishness to a lot of people, and it's okay. It's salvation to those of us who believe, and to many of them who will believe. Amen. So close that I can feel you, and I've lost the words. And though my eyes have never seen you, I've seen enough to say. I know. Yeah.